I'm Dr. Melissa Wilson. I'm a faculty in the Center for Evolution and Medicine and the School of Life Sciences. Um, I wanted to announce that along with each of our speakers, we have a journal club. So if you want, we read at least one paper from that person ahead of time, and then we meet to discuss it so that we can be all prepared for the presentation. Um, the EVMED Journal Club will now be an ECG, Engineering Center G Wing, G237, from 12.30 to 1.30, the Tuesday prior to the speaker. And if you want more information to get on a contact list, so you get an email with the paper and when we're meeting, um, email Kenneth Buteau at asu.edu. Okay, I'm pumped to see so many people here. Uh, so I'm very excited that we have Dr. John Fryer here today. So um, last year, actually, we were in the midst of, well, not we, but other people of recruiting you to come here and you presented last year and I saw you present and I was like, oh, this is the coolest stuff I've ever seen. Uh, mainly because I'm a computational scientist and when I see computation applied to biology to actually figure out real things and make people's lives better, it, justifies my existence. Um, with that, though, this in particular is most interesting because as some of you know, the center has been working on new pillars and directions going forward, and some of them are thinking about the role of sex differences in the immune system and how that may have shaped a bunch of different diseases, including Alzheimer's disease. And what Dr. Fryer studies is Alzheimer's disease and lots of the immune system, and in addition to everything else, right? We all don't fit into one nice, tidy box. And so a little bit, one thing I like to mention, because we have a lot of students in the audience, is that, well, can, can, I, can I mention you started at ASU? Okay, right, okay, so he started at ASU, and like all of us, our trajectories on our CV are not the same as our trajectories in real life, right? Our CV is a CV of successes, and, um, I know I certainly stumble along the way, but you all just get to see the successes. So um, Dr. Fryer started at ASU in engineering and then uh, that wasn't a good fit, thankfully for us, because now, uh, no, no, no. Um, he then switched to U of A, engineering at ASU and then switched to U of A in microbiology. And that kind of set him on a very different track. And after graduating, rather than going directly to school, he worked at Barrow Neurological Institute um, looking at nicotine addiction in cells and cell culture, and, uh, and then went to graduate school at Wash U in St. Louis, which is very close to Nebraska, for those of you that know geography. And then after that, um, has just made a really amazing career <laughs> for himself in Florida. And then we said, well, why don't you come back to Arizona? I mean, it's blazingly hot and you'll get dehydrated, but there's all these wonderful people here who are interested in evolution and medicine and neuroscience. And he's now an associate professor of neuroscience at Mayo Clinic in Scottsdale. Um, and so close enough that we can entice him to come and talk with us and try to build additional connections for research, for opportunities for students and opportunities for new collaborations. So with that, I will let you get going and thank you so much for coming. Thanks for having me. I'll just use this thing if that's working. Oh, thanks. Um, so it's exciting to be here and I'll just, um, uh, I have no disclosures, unfortunately. Hope to in one day have something to disclose. Um, and, but I will acknowledge uh, and disclose up front that I'm not a computational biologist. I'm a neuroscientist by training, mostly. And um, I'm picking it up as I go along because uh, that's where the science has taken me. It's a little feedback. Is it something on this or over there that you've got to do? This has no dials or switches. Uh, so. Most of what my lab studies is Alzheimer's disease, and um, uh, we study a, a, a number of other neurodegenerative diseases that are um, loosely defined as uh, related dementias. Um, uh, a lot of what I'll show is, is relevant to Alzheimer's, and at the end, I'm going to talk some more general um, uh, topics related to, to genome biology. So for those of you uh, who don't know, if I can step over here so I can see my own slides. Um, 
Uh, Alzheimer's disease is the most common form of dementia. It's not the only form of dementia, but it's certainly the most common. Uh, it's because the population is living longer. Uh, sometime in the next 30 or so years, there will be 14 million people in the US and 150 million people worldwide uh, living with the disease. It has huge um, uh, economic impact. Uh, <clears throat> some of what we know currently, like many complex diseases, uh, there are some known risk factors. The single greatest risk factor is age. Uh, genetics certainly plays um, uh, a large part, um, but most of it is, like other uh, complex genetics, is uh, there's a bunch of uh, risk genes. Um, there's very few causative genes, except in, except in some rare, rare cases of uh, familial Alzheimer's disease. Uh, it accounts for less than 1% of um, all AD cases. And then there's a, a whole host of contributing factors, um, cardiovascular disease, um, type 2 diabetics are at, at much higher risk for developing AD, um, some pathways like oxidative dam damage, inflammation that I'll talk a lot about today, um, TBI or, or other forms of uh, uh, repetitive or traumatic brain injury, uh, and then um, sex. So there's a definite biological difference. Females are at higher risk for Alzheimer's disease. And this is not simply explained by the fact that females live, live longer than males. And this, there's a lot of um, uh, research that's, uh, that's being focused on in this topic. So just some, some basics so we're all on the same page. Um, the progression of Alzheimer's disease, if you think about a, a healthy brain, here's your, your gray matter and your white matter, um, all these uh, sulci, <clears throat> and a neuron, um, has this uh, one of the microtubules, one of the major microtubules in the brain, is composed of this tau protein. <clears throat> As you progress through Alzheimer's disease, um, you get these formations of these amyloid plaques that form in the extracellular space. And then, subsequent to that, um, you get this um, aggregation and misfolding of the tau protein that leads to tangles uh, in, in disease neurons. This is what you would see microscopically. Macroscopically, you see uh, ventricular enlargement of the brain and um, thinning of the gray matter, especially in, in certain areas like the, the hippocampus, entorhinal cortex. And then as the disease really uh, progresses, <clears throat> progresses, you get um, uh, cortical thinning uh, in a large uh, portion, certainly, of the frontal cortex. Um, so here's another, uh, this is a cartoon view of um, uh, a normal brain and an Alzheimer's disease brain with these amyloid plaques and some neurons that are starting to bear um, what we call tangles that are composed of that tau protein. Um, this is what it looks like uh, histologically. If you use antibodies that stain these extracellular plaques, you get these diffuse plaques. You get these dense cord plaques. These are immunostains. You can use um, silver stains uh, that just bind to um, uh, probably mostly aggregated structures in the brain. This is a cord plaque, and you can see each of these, these, um, these uh, varicosities here, we call them, or, or dist uh, dystrophic neurites. You can see these thin threads here in this slide. These are normal caliber um, axons and dendrites in the brain. These are swollen. 10, 20, 50 times their normal diameter. So this disrupts communication. And then some of these, you can see some of these tangles forming that the same silver, uh, uh, silver stain um, will allow you to visualize. There's some fluorescent dyes. Thioflavin S is one of the, the most commonly used ones that stains these dense core plaques. And you can see this, um, this thioflavin positive plaque that we see. And thioflavin is a dye that, that binds to beta sheet structures, and the tau protein also forms these beta sheet structures. So you can see these neurons that are um, uh, tangle-bearing neurons. But I think one thing to keep in mind is that all these changes that I showed you occur years or decades before the onset of symptoms. So the amyloid, this A-beta curve in red, starts to occur, and then actually the, by the time you start getting this MCI or mild cognitive impairment, the brain is almost um, topped out. It's almost saturated in the amount of amyloid that, that occurs. But still, before this MCI, this prodromal period, um, this blue curve is the, ta is the tau 
um, uh, accumulation in the brain, you have to have quite a substantial amount of tau to start getting um, clinical, uh, uh, clinical symptoms. Um, so this purple curve is the, the memory uh, impairment that occurs, and, it, and then once you start showing symptoms, it's a, a, a progressive um, uh, decline or, or, or an increase in the, the amount of memory impairment, um, uh, culminating in, in full-blown dementia. <clears throat> and so um, I'm going to be talking some about genetics. Um, this is a review a few years ago by Allison Goat and Celeste Karsh uh, when, the, when Allison was at WashU. And this is a, a plot showing Alzheimer genes um, uh, as a function of uh, their level of risk in terms of conferring risk for the disease. And um, on the x-axis is how common they are in the population. So up here you have these very rare, less than 1%, these genes that we've known about for almost 30 years in presenilin-1, presenilin-2, and amyloid precursor protein. These two genes are involved in the processing of the amyloid precursor protein to form amyloid. And APP is amyloid precursor protein. A, a portion of that is what um, uh, encodes for the amyloid beta peptide that gets uh, released uh, uh, extracellularly and aggregates. And then there's some that are um, still very rare, but not as high a penetrance. These, these are familial causes, so high risk virtually. Um, uh, you're guaranteed to get the disease if you have one of these mutations. Most of these are um, more common variants, but lower risk. The most common um, genetic variant, or the strongest genetic variant, is this ApoE4 allele. ApoE, ApoE comes in three alleles, ApoE2, 3, and 4. If you have one copy of ApoE4, uh, you're at about threefold higher risk for developing Alzheimer's disease. If you're unlucky and you have two copies, you're at somewhere between 12 and 20-fold higher risk of developing Alzheimer's disease, depending on the, the data set you're looking at. <clears throat> um, and then there's a bunch of other genes here that, that have higher frequency in the population, but confer low risk. And so we're trying to understand there's about 20 or so, or 40, depending on how loose you are with the statistics, um, Alzheimer genes, each of them conferring you know, a eight, maybe 10% higher risk. Um, and so we're trying to understand these. The, the color coding here is colored by, um, loosely colored by what pathway they're uh, uh, purported to be involved in um, from APP metabolism, tau metabolism, cholesterol, immune response. And so what I want to draw your attention to is, is the number of these that are in the immune response, uh, that is the shaded blue. So there's this big push in Alzheimer's disease to try to understand the component of inflammation in, in the disease pathogenesis. And this was really solidified um, by the discovery of TREM2, very rare coding mutations in TREM2 that confer very high risk uh, for Alzheimer's disease. Currently, I think the meta-analysis places it at about somewhere between two and three-fold higher risk uh, for disease. TREM2 is a gene that's uh, exclusive to the immune system, and in the brain, it's exclusively expressed by microglia, the immune cells of the brain that I'll talk more about. So this, along with all these other factors, um, has really pushed the field to try to understand what is the role of inflammation in the brain. Um, inflammation can mean very different things, um, and it can mean different things at different stages of the disease. It, it might be good early and bad late, or bad early and good late, and we're still trying to get a handle on that. <clears throat> I think I'm going to uh, just show you that um, uh, a lot of this is mediated, when we talk about inflammation in the, in the brain, is mediated by glia. Uh, this is Latin for glue, uh, but I think we know that they're not just glue. This is uh, Santiago Ramoni Cajal. This is the father of modern neurobiology. <clears throat> and he used these silver stains and hand drew these, these beautiful neuronal structures in the brain by just looking in the microscope and drawing them. And he surprisingly inferred a massive amount of, of brain function that still holds true today. And the stain that he used um, was great at, um, at staining neurons. Uh, and this is cerebellum, and these are cortical neurons. It stained a little bit these uh, cortical astrocytes, uh, or star-like cells. These are um, one of the major glial cell types in the brain. But it wasn't very good at picking up um, 
microglia, the immune cells of the brain that are most closely related to myeloid lineage cells or, or monocytes in the periphery. And it was a student of his, um, or, or he was a student in the same institute, uh, Pio del Rio Ortega, that um, kept tinkering with the dye, the silver stain, until he lit up these cells. And they had um, pretty famous arguments about the existence of these cells that he was picking up in very faint signals until he really perfected the dye. And the latter half of, of Ramon y Cajal's career and, and all of Rio uh, Ortega's career focused on glia. Um, but I think you know, much of the field focus on neurons, they're the, the communicating cells of the brain, but had they used dyes that were stronger at picking up astrocytes, we may, we, the astrocyte and the glial biology might not have lagged so far behind. So I've sort of alluded to this, that, that inflammation occurs in Alzheimer's disease, but anytime there's an insult to the brain, there's some level of inflammation. It can be very localized, it can be very minor, um, my lab studies most of the, the, the top half of this were very interested, I'm not going to talk about it today, in infection-related uh, uh, changes in inflammation that impinge upon the CNS, like sepsis and meningitis. Aging, as I'll show you, um, uh, is a, a condition that leads to increased inflammation, or inflammaging, as it's been called sometimes. And then it's a heavy component of neurodegenerative diseases, not just Alzheimer's, but frontotemporal dementia, ALS, PD, DLB, Huntington's, um, uh, spinal cerebellar ataxias. Um, and um, they each may share some common pathways, but they probably um, all share distinct um, pathways and mechanisms of inflammation. So one of the things I really wanted to do when I, when I started my lab was to understand microglia in some of these disease states and in some of the, the animal models that we have of the disease. And what we decided to do was to take a translational profiling approach. <clears throat> and there have been many studies over the years in which people have taken um, brain tissue from a model or from uh, human cases. You dissociate the cells, you do um, flow cytometry or fax sorting of the cells. And then you do transcriptomics um, either on, on microarrays in the old days or RNA-seq currently. But we had the suspicion that when you do that, when you take a, the process of removing an immune cell out of its normal environment and all the stuff it's used to sensing on a daily basis, and you remove all those cues and environment, that it would activate the cell. So we use this trap approach because it's a, it's a genetic model. So you, you use cree locks um, system, for those of you who are familiar with mouse genetics. And you essentially genetically tag all of the, the ribosomal subunits in a cell type of interest. So we tagged all the ribosomal, ribosomal subunits in microglia. So we use this CX3CR1 is a canonical microglial marker gene. And there's Cree lines that have been developed. And um, when you do this, it is very efficient at recombining all of the, the, the microglia in the brain, 99.9% .9 at least. Um, are all positive for that, that ribo tag that we've introduced here. And what this allows you to do is to, um, as soon as you can get the brain out of the mouse, you can um, homogenize it in the presence of cyclohexamide to sort of lock the mRNA onto the, the nascent polysomes. Then you can use really harsh methods to purify the RNA, do RNA-seq, et cetera. So it bypasses any cellular activation that might occur during sorting. So we did this and we put it head to head with um, sorted microglial cells and we said, okay, well, how do they compare? And if we just take all the top genes, if you, if you rank them by, by what comes up in, in the ribotag data set, they're all known uh, microglial marker genes that we use day in and day out to stain for them and, and identify them. And they're in fairly good agreement with cell sorted data. A little, the rankings change a little bit because the methodologies are slightly different. Um, we think part of it is due to some of the activation. But this gave us confidence it works. But what was interesting, if you look at the other way around and you sort the transcripts, um, uh, if you rank them by the, the, the methodology of cell sorting, there are many of these that are simply, um, not only are they not um, abundant, they're not even expressed in micro, all these um, red arrowheads. And if you look at this um, uh, in a broader fashion, there's almost 300 transcripts that are more than tenfold activated in microglia from cell sorting, 50 of which are more than 100-fold activated. 
Um, and we did a lot of work that went into this paper that we published last year in JX Med to show that this isn't due to digestion uh, temperature, which many people would have um, suspected, but actually it was when you remove the myelin that you have to do to sort cells so it doesn't clog the cell sorter. For some reason, when you take that myelin signal away, that's when the microglia were, were becoming activated. So we did a sort of proof of principle um, study. We used um, lipopolysaccharide, or LPS. This is a bacterial cell wall component that um, elicits a strong immune response. Some people use it as a sort of model of sterile sepsis. So if you give it to a mouse or any animal, it'll elicit this huge immune response. So we, we looked at that and said, well, what are the transcripts that would be altered in microglia um, if after an LPS uh, challenge? <clears throat> How would they look? How would you rank your transcripts if you use cell sorted data versus ribotag? And the answer is there's almost no overlap, especially if you're ranking uh, the changes that occur. This is fold induction, so some of these change by several thousand fold. And um, there are a couple of shared transcripts. Um, this is ranked by cell sorting data, and this is ranked by ribotag, um, the, the level of fold change. So I think you can, you can uh, uh, pretty easily appreciate that if you are interested in chasing this particular model and this, um, uh, what may be functional consequences, uh, you'd probably be chasing a lot of artifact here. This is another way of looking at it if you do principal component analysis, uh, and maybe those of you who are in Melissa's class have gotten to this yet, or you will. Um, this is a way to compress the, the data um, uh, uh, into three-dimensional space in this case. So if you look at this, the ribotag saline mice compared to just cell sorted by saline has a massive influence uh, in the principal component one, or that is the most variance in the data. The saline in the ribotag is different than LPS, but this, the magnitude of this effect is actually less than just sorting the cells alone. So we did all that not because we were necessarily interested in LPS. We did all that because we wanted to really know what's really changing in microglia in our disease models. And, and for this study, we focused on an amyloid model in which um, two of the genes that I showed you before, the APP and the presenilin genes, have been introduced um, to make transgenic mice many years ago. They develop amyloid plaques in the brain. They don't really develop um, tau tangles. So this is a, probably one of the most popular amyloid models. To induce tangles in the brain, we used this model that we developed uh, and published a few years ago where we use uh, adeno-associated virus, or AAV, to overexpress a familial uh, mutation in tau, P301L. And it gets, when you do these injections of AAV in a, in a P0 mouse brain into the ventricles, it sort of um, transduces the entire brain, uh, what some people call somatic brain transgenesis. And we get a, a high level of transduction throughout the mouse brain. This is a, a sagittal section. And we compared it um, to the a popular transgenic model, 4510. So these mice get a lot of tau, they start to get neurons that die in the hippocampus. There's a lot of gliosis that you can see that occurs. This is in the hippocampus. This is IBA1, a marker of microglia. You can see they're sort of thick and activated. It occurs in the cortex. They get astrogliosis too, um, identified by GFAP. So we use these two models in the ribotag context, uh, along with just mice that were normally aged. So no pathology, they're just old. These, these models are nine month old, the aged mice were 24 months. And what was interesting, and frankly a little surprising, we, we were suspecting that the amyloid and tau would have shared overlap. These are volcano plots of the, um, the significance um, plotted by the fold change, either up or down, uh, log two fold change. And there's a lot of these um, genes that we've highlighted here that are, that are shared between the, the amyloid model and the tau model that you can see here if you just glance through um, uh, APOE, CST7, CCL3. What was surprising to us is how much of these, essentially a large majority of the signature was shared in just aged mice. And in fact, some of the changes were even greater in aged mice than in the amyloid or tau models. These are brains that are loaded. This is a fairly um, mid to late stage of disease in these models. So these brains are loaded with amyloid and tau, and yet um, some of the changes that are occurring just to aging um, were um, equal or greater in magnitude. And one of the things that caught our eye that I, that I already mentioned is APOE. Um, 
and uh, mice only have one isoform. All species except human have one isoform of ApoE. What caught our eye was that if you look just in young mice, ApoE, this is a, a, a rank of the abundance of transcripts um, from the ribotag data. TyroBP is um, a, a very abundant a marker gene for microglia. TMM19, TMM119 is a marker gene for microglia that's exclusive to microglia, not other myeloid lineage cells. Um, CX3CR1, um, AIF1, also called IVA1, TRIM2, that I've already talked about. These are all canonical microglial genes. ApoE is actually um, almost abund as abundant as these and more abundant in uh, microglia than even these marker genes. And then, uh, uh, so it's already very abundant, and then when you add the insults of aging or amyloid or tau, um, uh, it becomes even more uh, upregulated. So we're studying this functionally and, and hope to have a paper come out later this year where we've um, genetically or conditionally deleted ApoE just from microglia and see um, uh, how it affects not just the inflammatory state of microglia, but how does it alter amyloid or, or tau pathology? And the answer is yes. I don't, I don't want to, this is recorded in case you guys watching. So um, when, we, when we got this data, we did uh, some pretty crude analysis using Ingenuity, Ingenuity Pathway. Um, I don't know if uh, some of the students are familiar with this. It's a, uh, uh, biologically but also some manual curation uh, database that, that puts genes into pathways. And the top hierarchical pathway that was formed from this um, said that APOE is, is driving this pathway. You can see in red here, these are hits that came up from this shared um, aging amyloid and tau signature and it sort of converges on CCL3 and 4 signaling. I don't know if this pathway is true. We're, we're testing it, and we have the conditional knockouts where we've removed APOE, and we're seeing how these components change. And one thing that I, uh, that I highlighted last time I was here, and we're still following up on this, all of the data that I showed you um, from those, those models were all male mice. These were pretty pricey experiments to do. In the aging set, we did include females. And to our surprise, Everything in this network, in this APOE network, but basically everything that, that gets activated in microglia due to aging was higher in females. And here's an example of uh, some individual examples here. And we um, suggested in, our, in this, this paper that um, this could um, partially explain some of the increased risk for Alzheimer in females if, if uh, something about the female brain or the female immune system is making them hyperreactive to aging or amyloid or tau or, or all of those three, which, which occurs in the human condition, um, that, that maybe that's, that's not good. We still don't know the answer to that. And there's a lot of studies trying to determine um, not just APOE, but just microglia in general. Are they, um, some people have done some chemical ablation by removing microglia from the brain entirely. And it doesn't really it changes the inflammatory tone for sure, but it doesn't seem to change much else. It doesn't have a major impact on pathology. And that may be because um, uh, dysfunction is worse than death. And this is a, something that I bring up with my lab a lot, that just because microglia aren't there, it may be worse to have dysfunctional microglia than, um, uh, than ones that are just not present. So we've made a, a pretty crude website that we're going to overhaul soon, but um, we just, we hosting the data here, you can search for your gene of interest. You can see how it changes in middle age um, or old ages in males and females and amyloid and tau. We, we added um, LPS or poly-IC, which is sort of a viral mimetic. It's another way to stimulate the immune system. And you can see how much sorting impacts um, your gene and tabular format. There's also, a, uh, if you go to this, there's a link to a, an Excel file to just download the data. Um, as we were doing this, one of the things that really came online was um, single-cell RNA-seq, and it, and it became feasible for um, small labs like mine at the time to, to jump in and do. And for those of you who aren't um, familiar with single-cell RNA-seq, um, what it gets you is um, cellular resolution of the transcriptome. And I like to use the analogy of the bad fruit in the blender, there have been many studies in mouse models and human tissue where you do bulk RNA-seq, so you grind the tissue up. <clears throat> Imagine you have bad fruit that you put in with a bunch of good fruit in the blender and you tasted that. You, knew it, you would know it tastes bad, but you wouldn't know 
who the culprit is. And that's all of the bulk RNA-seq studies that have been done before this technology really became prime time. So the one that we use, and it's, I think it's probably the most popular one in the field right now, is you take um, complex tissue, a brain in our case, you dissociate into single cells, you put it through a microfluidic device where you merge cells with an oil and a barcoded or a gel emulsion bead. Um, this is the 10X Genomics platform. You have barcoded um, cDNA that's barcoded um, for the cell, and then it also has a unique molecular identifier because there's so much library amplification that occurs. Um, you need to rule out um, what is amplification bias, and that's one way that we use for that. I'm not going to go into all the analysis um, that, that is done for single cell data. There's some very crude things that you would do um, normally from any RNA-seq data set. You would do some read QC. You would align it and, and map it. Um, some of the cellular quality control that we do is, um, is to, to filter out cells that have high um, uh, ribosomal or mitochondrial gene content. Um, cells that are partially dying or that have partially lysed um, based on um, data, at least from cells and culture, suggest that, that, that cells that are really high in these or that have significant fraction of, of mitochondrial ribosomal reads um, are probably degraded cells, and so those are, are filtered out. But then there's a whole lot of normalization, um, and uh, uh, this is sort of the Wild West still of single-cell data pipelines. We use the Surratt package. I think most of what I'm going to show today is Surratt 2.0. There's, there's beta 3.0 that's, that's available now that we've also played with. Each time you do it, you get a, a similar answer, but a different answer, and this is where it's really challenging that the needle constantly moves. Um, this is one of the first studies we did um, in that mouse model of amyloidosis that I showed you. And uh, we used an enzymatic um, digestion procedure that we knew was favorable at releasing microglia because uh, we wanted to focus on it for this study. We got a few other cell types that came along for the ride like uh, astrocytes, a little tiny population of neurons and some, um, some other cells. But most of this um, each of these dots is a single cell. We're microglia. And what I'll draw your attention to is this, this nub down here was mostly comprised of cells that, that came from our amyloid model. And if we plot the, the total fraction of cells in each of those clusters that I showed you, this in red here is that what we're calling an activated microglial cluster. Um, there's an expansion of that population in these four individual mice that we did that had amyloid. Um, and they have a clear signature, you'll, if you can see these gene names, there's some of them are, are here also, these are shared um, from the, what we found in the ribotag data. So the ribotag data, um, it's microglia only, but it's still a bulk cell type RNA-seq. And um, what this tells us is that it's not all microglia that are expressing these, um, uh, these genes, these activated signature, it's just a subpopulation. And these are violin plots showing some of these genes, CST7, where um, I'm not going to show the data, but we've, we've got some knockout mice for this, along with CCL3 and 4, that we're studying functionally. Here's APOE again. You can see that, that APOE is expressed in, in all these microglia at pretty high levels, and then, then again in this activated population it goes up. And then we have a few that go down. Many of these are canonical microglial genes that we um, and others call homeostatic genes that keep them... Uh, happy, and some that, that, so these go down, they don't go off, but we have a few that go off, and we're studying these uh, functionally also for, to determine their meaning. We've, uh, we've started applying uh, pseudotime analysis that um, will allegedly get you at cellular trajectories or transition states. And if you do this in our microglial data set, you can see that some of these um, uh, genes are good at um, distinguishing um, this branch into this activated cluster here, uh, or this uh, state three from the pseudotime data. It's I, at present, I'm not so sure that this is any more informative than the plots I showed you before. It maybe is more informative for data where we don't have such massive changes, and I I don't think I put it in here, but we're doing this in some of the vascular cells, um, and then we do some you know, some old school stuff like just um, gene ontology, CAG, um, biological process, molecular function. What's interesting to us is that this activated signature 
has a massive upregulation of ribosomal um, subunits and translational machinery. We saw that in our ribotag data and we sort of hid it because we didn't want people to think that it was somehow biased because we were pulling down ribosomes even though we were um, directly comparing to control mice that pull down ribosomes also. But our interpretation based on those two data is that when microglia are activated, they've ramped up their translational mach machinery to make and secrete stuff. <clears throat> One of the things that we've really um, been doing a lot of lately are um, gene co-expression networks. So you may be familiar with this. This has been done for um, bulk RNA-seq for many years, and you need a lot of, of data to do it, so people have applied it to um, in, at least in, in the Alzheimer field, they've applied it to, to a lot of these um, sequencing consortiums where they've done RNA-seq on hundreds of cases and hundreds of controls to try to understand what are um, genes that maybe don't change a lot, but um, maybe um, drivers of disease pathogenesis because they are um, highly connected or at least highly correlated to other genes. And so um, that's been done for Alzheimer's and many other diseases. Um, to my knowledge, we're the, one, the first ones to apply this to single cell data, and, and, uh, unless we're scooped. Um, but we applied this to the microglial gene set, and there's some interesting things that emerged here. There's these large hubs. So the size of these um, uh, relates to how strong of a hub it is. That is, how strongly do changes in this gene affect changes in the entire network or this local module. And so this set, um, this whole set in red, um, is what we're calling the activation switch, that a sub part of that module are these homeostatic genes, and then a different part of the module that's still highly connected to this are these genes that change a lot with activation state. And then there's others that are, um, that are involved in complement, uh, uh, cathepsin and uh, 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 cystatin um, uh, pathways. What was interesting to us, and this is what I like about this is, like many of these, it's hypothesis generating. TyroBP, uh, which is a, a direct binding partner of TREM2 that I talked about, is in this network that's connecting it to the this ribosomal switch. And this is not something that has been postulated before, but is TyroBP part of what's serving that switch to turn on microglial translational function. And so we're, we're pursuing that. Um, unfortunately, uh, I think we have to do it in vivo because um, the networks do not hold up. The, the, the function of microglia in vitro um, is very different than in vivo. Um, I'll skip this in the interest of time. Um, one of the things that we're very interested in knowing, these are all mouse models, but how well um, do mouse models um, reflect the human disease? You're only as good as your model. But bes besides that, how well do, does the mouse immune system, or in this case microglia, how reflective is it of the human immune system or human microglia? So there's a couple of data sets out there that are single cell data sets. There's a lot of single nucleus data sets, but that has a whole other host of problems. But if you look at two data sets, this is a mouse model that uh, um, uh, Matthew Blurton Jones at, at uh, University of California, Irvine, created in which he took hematopoietic precursor cells and, and engrafted them into a mouse, and they, they take up residence as, as microglia in the human, um, human microglia in the mouse brain. And he did single cells, so we took his data and we, and we did um, Magina, this gene network, and the networks are totally different. It doesn't even have the core. They express the markers, so they're microglia by markers, but the gene networks are totally different. Moreover, we're generating our own human um, microglial uh, data sets, but this one was uh, available in preprint. These are microglia that are adjacent to a, a glioblastoma, so a brain tumor, so they're probably not normal. Um, but you can see that these, again, are very different from these are very different from uh, the mouse microglia. So uh, I remain agnostic, and I told my lab I'm fine jettisoning all our mouse colonies if, if we can provide um, enough evidence to say we should just not be studying the immune system uh, or the role of the immune system in these mouse models. Um, one of the things that we are also interested in is the vascular pathology that forms in Alzheimer's disease. This is um, sometimes called a third pathology. 
This is uh, uh, pictures that I've showed you before of one of these mouse models, these amyloid plaques. We have an interest in the vascular pathology because one of the Alzheimer genes, uh, clusterin or CLU, when we uh, bred this uh, mouse model into CLU knockout backgrounds, all of the amyloid that normally forms in these extracellular plaques in the neuropil be between neurons, um, it all deposited instead in the cerebrovasculature. So we did this um, study where we, um, again, we chose a different enzymatic mix that was good at releasing vascular cells. We also magnetically depleted um, um, uh, large populations of microglia and astrocytes. And then we did single cell RNA-seq, and I'll just show you a little bit of this data. You still mostly get endothelial cells. These are cells that form the capillary networks in your brain and, and are responsible for blood-brain barrier transport. We were very interested in these mural cells, which are composed of pericytes and smooth muscle cells. One of the things that we weren't expecting, I guess you might have expected it, but we were sort of pleased with the robustness of it. This is just two mice per group, but you can see um, the, the level of enrichment, or I, that is the number of cells that are present in each of these clusters. We already know there's a little bit of expansion of microglial populations, and this single cell, um, just the numbers in each of the populations recapitulates that. We knew that um, mural cells die due to amyloidosis in, in the vasculature, and we see that. And then we also saw, um, uh, surprisingly, that there's an infiltration of, of peripheral blood uh, cells. And I'll get back to that in a minute. One of the things, as we were preparing this, that we were um, scooped on, but being scooped also is validating if it's, um, uh, is it, as long as it's not the major part of your story. Uh, there was this um, uh, single-cell RNA-seq study that, des that described zonation, or that is, um, transitions from pericytes into smooth muscle cells in the, in the cerebrovasculature. And we saw the exact same thing uh, in our data. If you just take that mural cluster and we use some, some differentials here between what's on this edge and this edge, or we use pseudotime analysis or other um, factors. And, and so we recapitulated this, this finding that was published in Nature on this um, pericyte and smooth muscle cell zonation. <clears throat> One of the things that's, that, that we're following up on, and it's actually confirmed other data that we had in lab, I have an immunologist in lab that's interested in immune cells that infiltrate, infiltrate the brain in Alzheimer's disease and in the mouse models. And there are some T cells that we found, and um, especially um, interfering gamma positive T cells, if you look in this cluster down here, almost all of them are coming from the mice that have amyloid. And so this, this corroborated data that we had, flow cytometry data that we were actually preparing for publication, and now we're trying to understand um, uh, what it is ab about the, the environment of the brain that's recruiting these T cells. We think it's some of the microglial signals, but that jury is still out. And then we've been constructing um, these gene networks. Um, this is of the mural cell network. Um, and we've been constructing gene networks of the endothelial cells. Uh, and these are interesting, again, because they give us testable hypotheses on what may drive um, phenotypes in these cells, and we're still doing the analysis to see how they're associated with the model, the, the insults that are present, at least in this amyloid model. Um, and so we're doing that with um, uh, these in particular, we can use viral approaches. Microglia, unfortunately, we have to go the long way because they're, they're not transduced with virus. So um, we've got a lot of uh, uh, projects ongoing that are related to all of these conditions, um, especially DLB, um, FTD-ALS, and, and, and AD, um, that we're doing a lot of single cell uh, approaches um, and single nucleus approaches. And we've got a, a lot of studies focused on this and, and aging. Um, one of the things that I wanted to, to, to also highlight that we're doing in my lab that we came about in a sort of circuitous fashion is um, uh, the manuscript that I sent that we published in, in Genome Biology this year. And um, uh, this cartoon is sort of um, depicting someone looking for their wallet or keys, like looking for your car keys in the light analogy. And we started thinking about this um, and how what you may be missing by looking at, at short read data, 99.9% um, .9 of whole genome sequence is, is derived from short reads. Um, I have Illumina here, but Illumina bought PacBio, so now I have to scratch that out. Um, so 
short reads have the advantage they were sort of the first ones to come online, the first ones to market, and so they dominate the market. They're cheap, under $1,000 a genome. I think the Uniform Services University is now offering $500 whole genomes. They're very accurate for single nucleotide variants, uh, and there's widely available um, tools to analyze your data. <clears throat> the disadvantage is that they miss large structural variants. There's some band-aids that people have, have uh, come up with to try to infer structural variation due to short read data, but most of the time you have to know what you're looking for in order to see them. Uh, they, they can't handle repetitive elements, and, the, and they, they sort of um, are very poor at handling really GC-rich sequences. Um, conversely, the long read, um, either PacBio or Oxford Nanopore, we've, we've generated some data in our lab for both of these, or for 10x Genomics, which is synthetic long read, which is same idea as the single cell, where you merge a cell with a lipid droplet and barcoded beads, except in this case you're merging a chunk of DNA with a lipid droplet and you, and you generate sequence. Um, these all handle, um, uh, the, the, these technologies handle repetitive elements and they capture structural variation. The long reads also um, uh, handle the structural variation, but they can't call repetitive elements because at the end of the day, they're still um, based on short read data that's, that's assembled um, locally in that droplet. The downside is that these are really expensive. They're still probably to get the same depth is over $5,000 a genome. So we did this proof of concept study that we published last year, and we took a case that we thought would be the most challenging for a, a long read sequencer to handle, and that is this C9 ORF72 GGGGCC repeat expansion that is repeated hundreds or thousands of times of individuals with frontotemporal dementia or ALS. And we said, well, how can the, these other platforms handle that? <clears throat> and essentially the answer is if, you, if these technologies had existed and were, were readily available in 2011 when this gene was discovered by Rosa Rademakers at Mayo Clinic, it would have been found, quote, overnight because it stuck out like a sore thumb because these technologies can, um, some of the reads will tra traverse the entire repeat. And it's just, it sticks out and it was immediately called. So um, uh, we started thinking about what else is missing. And um, this is the, the paper that we published um, this year. Is my timing 12.50 or 1 o'clock? Couple minutes, okay. I'm almost done. So um, we published this paper where we, we called these dark and camouflage genes. The reason we went to the lengths to describe this on a genome-wide scale is because we had a trio, uh, an affected individual and two parents that were unaffected that had been screened for all known, this was an ALS case. All the known mutations were negative, including C9 or 72. And we thought, well, let's, let's try a, a long read genome. And we did all three of them. Uh, not too deep, but fairly deep, and there are many, we still don't think we've nailed the, the mutation, but one of the hits that potentially came up because it was carried in this individual but not either of the, uh, of the parents was this HSPA1A gene, and when we looked at it, we said, well, let's go look in other databases at what are known mutations in, in AD, or there's large sequencing consortiums. And it was our surprise, these are plots from the exact database, if you're familiar with that, it's um, um, whole exome data that's uh, managed by Broad of 60,000 individuals, it's blank. <clears throat> and so this is what started the ball rolling for us. That maybe we should look at this in a more systematic way. And so this is some, some of the data from the paper where we call these genes camouflage because the sequence, and I can highlight it here a little better, there's nothing wrong with the sequence. It's high quality, but when you get to the aligner, it maps to two places on the genome equally, HSPA1A and A1B. This is a gene duplication. It maps, maps to each of them equally. It's, a, it's given a random location, but it assigns a map queue of zero or one, depending on the aligner that you use. So all the databases um, from case control studies and sequencing are missing HSPA1A and B. So this is a, a case of camouflage. Um, some genes, uh, like CR1, another Alzheimer gene, camouflage themselves because there's a, there's a repetitive, it's actually the, the complement, um, this is complement receptor one. Um, it's repeated, and so it's camouflaging itself. <clears throat> and when we looked at this, most of it is um, uh, intergenic, but we've, we focused in this paper at least 
on um, gene bodies. Um, and you can see how many of these fall within protein coding genes, uh, as well as other uh, gene biotypes. Um, many within that are, are intronic, um, but there are still many that are exonic. What was interesting is if you do some gene ontology, there's whole families uh, uh, of proteins, like these um, ubiquitin-specific uh, proteases, that are very similar to each other and are, are missing from whole genome data. This is a, a, a chromosomal plot showing each of these hash marks in red is the location on the genome where there is at least a, a, a protein coding gene that's at least 5% dark. And then we wanted to know how well does read length impact this? And I can tell you that um, if you change the, the library that was used to generate these PacBio or ONT libraries, these curves can shift dramatically. Um, but if you look at the, the, the order of genes and, and the percent of the genome that's dark, um, this is Illumina in red, the, the standard 100 base pair read sequences. Even just um, using lo slightly longer reads that nobody does because of cost, but even 250 base pair reads, which Illumina um, platforms can do, uh, was decent at reducing some of that. But um, what really uh, started to shine was these longer read um, technologies, particularly ONT, and I should say that this is a really long read library, like 100 KB library that went into this. We only have one because um, not there aren't large sequencing efforts with these platforms yet. But these are good at resolving most of the dark and camouflage regions. And additionally, was it, what was interesting to us is that um, this is more problematic in exome data than whole genome, but there's a lot of sequencing consortiums for Alzheimer's disease, the top Alzheimer gene, there's a stretch here that's dark. And it's dark um, not because of camouflage regions, it's dark because of um, probably technical bias. G this is a GC rich. It's known to be problematic. So we're not suggesting there's variants hiding in there in APOE, but um, at least for Alzheimer's disease, APOE is looked at in other methodologies. But uh, this, this also caught our interest. I already talked about CR1, it's, it's camouflaging itself. So the, the last thing that we did was that we tried to come up with our own band-aid to try to rescue some of these in all the existing sequencing databases uh, that are out there for Alzheimer's and others. It's pretty simple. For CR1, for example, there's three exons that are um, virtually identical and that come up uh, with MAPQ0. We mask two of these and we pile up all the reads into just a single one of these exons. Then you can do case control analysis. And we identified a CR1 frame chip mutation that I think when we published was five, now we have eight cases and zero controls. It's very rare, obviously. This is in like 50,000 individuals or something. So um, it's very rare, but um, uh, it's, uh, and we don't know exactly which one of these is, it is yet because we're still waiting on the DNA from these eight individuals to see which of these it falls in. But each of these are in that complement uh, binding region. And then one thing that we're exploring right now um, is this bio nano platform where you can isolate high molecular weight DNA and you stretch it into nano channels. And then you use a fluorescent probe at defined, um, uh, uh, that binds to the DNA sequence at, at known locations in the genome. And then you get a pattern that you can read out and you can map back to the genome. The advantage of this is that it's cheap. So you can do large structural variation. They, they, they suggest that they can get down to 500 base pair resolution. But this is less than $500 a sample, so you can do large studies with this platform. So some of the things that are, that are ongoing, um, it will be great student projects to take up if uh, any uh, undergrads uh, are listening. We're doing a lot of single cell RNA-seq of, of mouse, rat, and, and even swine models of these things that I've talked about. Um, we're doing single nucleus, um, as problematic as it is, sometimes you just have to go with what's available. So Mayo has a brain bank of 7,000 cases that we can leverage if, um, if we can convince ourselves that single nucleus really will give you disease signatures, not just atlas cells. We're also collaborating with Tom Beach, who runs the Banner ASU um, Brain Body Donation Program. We're doing this um, cell type specific structural variation. So um, there's somatic variation in your, in your DNA and we're interested in knowing in the brain at least, is that different for each of the major populations? Um, we're doing this long reads to generate isoseq, so isoform level RNA-seq data. And I didn't have time to talk about it, but there's a whole host of 
computational projects that we're doing um, looking at gut microbiome relationships um, in neurodegeneration um, and, and infection, but particularly in mood disorders. There's already an existing link in bio, in biologically between the gut microbiota and um, anxiety and depression. So we're, we're exploring this um, with mouse models and human samples. So these are people in my labs. Uh, Sylvia and Mark are, are two postdocs that are transitioning to independence, along with um, students, um, uh, Jonathan and Ola, and, and some technicians. And a lot of this is collaboration with a Mayo colleague and our funding sources. Thanks. So a few minutes for questions. Any questions? Okay, great. I have so many. Okay. Uh, <laughs> number one, though, is what sex was the mouse that you did the single cell in? Male. TSMB4X is an excellent gene that escapes inactivation. What? It's coming. What's interesting, we're fascinated by TMSB4X because it's coming up as a hub in many, not all, but many of the populations, endothelial cells and microglia. Um, and so we're really fascinated by this. Um, is it real or is it some artifact? Um, but, you know, I told my, if one of my students was really interested, I said, if you want to go to the length of getting a mouse model or we're going to do some stuff in culture, I'm not big on, uh, on in vitro culture stuff, but we're really interested in that. Um, so for people that didn't spend six years studying that gene, uh, it's a gene that's highly conserved on X and Y over time. So the Y chromosome lost about 90% of the gene content it shared with the X. And TSMXB4X has a Y-linked copy that's almost completely conserved. So the X, males have an X and a Y copy and females have two copies of it. And it's very tiny. It's like less mm -hmm. than 150 amino acids. It's just this eensy weensy little thing. And for some reason, it's been conserved for 90 million years. And like, so seeing that, it was like, it was this tiny little thing that I loved studying mm -hmm. in grad school. And to see it just pop out as a hub multiple times. Um, we don't know why it's conserved. In but some of these, it's the biggest hub. It's huge, right? Yeah. So why studying evolution could then be important for medicine. Like this Absolutely. is amazing. Yeah. Other thoughts or questions? No. Yeah. Yep. We'll use the microphone. Oh. Uh, <clears throat> This is Washington. I, I read your article. Uh, 76 DACA gene is so far you guys found. Mm -hmm. 76. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, those are genes that are completely dark. Yeah. Um, there's a, some genes only a stretch is dark, but there's, there's a significant number of genes that are completely dark. Um, yeah. Okay, we'll have one more. Uh, in your latest paper published in uh, Genome Biology, it says that you completely ignored uh, centromeres because they were unreadable. Um, so I was wondering what, differenti di what differentiates centromeres from like other uh, long-term tandem repeating genes such as like heat shock proteins. I know these are sort of, that's a rabbit hole we really didn't want to go down. These are problematic areas for everybody interested in um, genomics. Um, and it made things very messy when we tried to get too close to the centromere, so we just said, we'll ignore those regions for now. Okay. That's, it was just getting too complicated. <laughs> They're awful. Uh, so with that, let's thank our speaker again. Uh, thank you all for coming. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks.